us lift our voices. Come on, today we serve a God of breakthrough, a faithful God, amen? Come on. You can't. 
an amazing now. God that can make something out of anything. Amen? Amen? Well, good morning, you beautiful people. My name is Pastor Jason. I am also Pastor Jason in a slightly miniaturized version. That's right. And we want to welcome you all. Before you have a seat, turn around, give someone an air high five, give them a bump, tell them how glad you are to see them. Well, it is so good to see all you guys here in person today. And for those online, I want to say a big thank you as well. Uh, if it's your first time with us or you haven't been in a long while, I want to encourage you uh, to connect with us. We've got a wonderful welcome center out in our lobby for those that are in person. We'd love for you to go by afterwards. We've got someone there who wants to help you, encourage you, answer any questions you might have, and just really make this a great experience for you. And if you're uh, watching online or you're in person, you're like, hey, I prefer the digital route. All you've got to do is go to the Bay Church app and you just click conquer and you'll see a little tab that says welcome. By clicking that button, you can fill out just a little bit of information and we'll be able to connect with you over this next week. We just want to get to know you and give you a chance to really be able to connect in community. Also on that app, there's a great feature, uh, our notes section. So as you listen to Pastor John share in our teaching today, you'll be able to follow along with his teaching. There's a section where you can add in your own thoughts and comments and email it to yourself. So you have that to be able to review during the week and continue to grow in your journey with Jesus. Well, the Bay Church is not only all about loving God and loving people, but it's all about family. And so uh, maybe you're a new mom and you're looking for a place uh, for some privacy for nursing or changing a diaper or cuddling with your little one and don't want to miss out on the service, we have a mother's room just for you. If you have young children and they get a little restless and you're looking for a place to let them uh, have some fun and still stay engaged, we have the family room just to your right over here. Also, don't forget that we have uh, age-appropriate ministries for each one of your family members, whether that's infant through five-year-olds with early childhood or downstairs in our incredible zone for elementary age or out in our youth building. Uh, we have everything for family. That's right, youth section over here. Give it up. So don't forget, we have something for the whole family, Jace. That's right, and today marks a really special moment. Today we're going to be celebrating 10 years of faithful service as our lead pastors for Pastor John and Carrie Gregg. We're so thankful for them to be a part of our church family. And so we want you to watch this uh, video that kind of celebrates the last number of years, last 10 years, and then we're going to have a special moment uh, with John and Carrie after that. Check it out. Here's to the pioneers, the groundbreakers, the trailblazers, the risk takers, the ones who built something out of nothing the church of a few birthing many, who supernaturally knew that there was more. They wanted to see what God would do next. This is our legacy. They were faith-believing, house-meeting, tent-pitching visionaries, empowered by the Spirit, willing to do something and try something and be something new. They dug in to create the church we might someday be, the kind of church we might someday see. So what is the right way to honor their dedication? We honor their faith with a passionate pursuit, not a chasing of what he has done, but following their lead and pressing toward what he will do next. This is our legacy, but it's not over yet. And our story has only begun. What's up, Bay Church? Man, I just wanna say a huge congratulations to my friends, Pastor John and Carrie Gregg, 10 years, that is incredible. You two are amazing leaders, and I just wanna say thank you. When we planted this church nine years ago, it would not have been possible without your help, investment in our church plant, as well as in my leadership. So thank you guys, we love you, congratulations on 10 years, and we cannot wait to see what the next 10 hold. Love you guys. Hey everyone, it's Andrew McCourt here at uh, Bayside Church, and I just want to give a massive shout out to John and Kerry for 10 incredible years at the Bay Church. We love you guys, we love your church, and I just want to say it takes real people to stay in the game, and you stayed in the game. God is building a remarkable church through you. We love you. Keep going. Uh, hey, Bay Church, it's Pastor Ray Johnson from Bayside Church. I want to congratulate you, John and Carrie, on 10 amazing years of ministry. And somebody's asking me, why am I shooting this? And I was basically saying this because you're one of my favorite pastors. I mean that with all my heart. Um, you have vision and you were born motivated. Church, wouldn't you agree? Um, but most people with vision and that level of motivation 
aren't as humble as you are. You have stayed humble before God. God has blessed you. God is using you. And I actually feel like the best is yet to come. Okay, if I were anywhere near your church, you'd be the one I'd go to. So John, congratulations on 10 years. Looking forward to the next 20, my friend. How about that? Why don't you guys stand up and let's give them a warm welcome, our lead pastors, John and Carrie Gregg. Give it up for them. The Word of God says, and you may be seated, the Word of God says in Jeremiah 3.15, it says, Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. You know, Compassion Ministries consisted of a dumpster that used to be out on the West parking lot. And this is no joke. And you would bring in old clothes that you didn't want in your closet or old clothes that was collecting dust in the garage and we would dump it in there and we would hand that out whenever we did something. And occasionally, we also passed out sandwiches to people. But today, because of your leadership and your team, Carrie, we have a Clean Star program. We have a hot shower trailer. We have an adopt a school program. On Saturdays at 2 p.m., we have a food market where families can come up here and get bags of groceries for their household. It's incredible. You know, at Thanksgiving time, we hand out food. We don't ask you what church you go to, what religion you are. We bless people just to give. And that's, that's awesome what your team is doing. And then at Christmas time, go ahead, you can applause. You know, at Christmas time here at the Bay Church, we show Christ through our actions. We extend Christ to families. We give families gifts for their children that might not have anything. And we also provide them with a meal. So your team that you lead, you guys are doing an incredible job. And you're making an impact in Contra Costa County. To our leader, John, you know, the pandemic was extremely hard on everyone, especially businesses and churches. Because of your leadership and not rushing the issue and consistent prayer and waiting for God, God opened up the doors where we were able to merge with our sister church in Brentwood. So today, we have one church at two sites, Concord and Brentwood. That's a God thing, folks. Also, when you came to this church, we were known as Calvary Temple Church. This building needed lots of repairs. Oh, my. Inside here, this used to be basketball courts on that wall and on that wall. It doesn't look like that right now. It's a beautiful building, beautiful worship center, beautiful foyer, Beautiful kitchen, beautiful 220s rooms over on the side. The exterior of the building looks fabulous. And if you drive by at nighttime and you see the building lit up, it looks incredible. And I've had the privilege of being at this church 33 years. And every time I drive by, especially at nighttime, and I see the building lit up, I always say to myself, that's my church. I love it. You know, Pastor, through your teachings and your leadership, you have challenged all of our faith to be more like Christ. Thank you, John, for never failing to be an upstanding leader of integrity in the church of God and in our community. John, thank you for leading us through an example of servanthood, serving with confidence and joy. You inspire all of us to serve God with you. Last thing, John, you lead people with a happy heart. Thank you for being a phenomenal, exceptional, and excellent leader. We love you. All right, yeah, give it up, give it up. (laughs) 
Well, I had the great opportunity to be here 10 years ago when we were doing our pastoral search for Carrie as well as Pastor Greg. And I don't know if you knew this, but we were without a lead pastor for over two years. And I remember sitting across the table from Carrie with a bit of concern in her eyes because if you didn't know this, these two led a very vibrant um, church family in Montana called Christian Center. And for them to come here was a big leap of faith. And uh, sitting across the table, I can only think to myself, little do they know what a great church family that we have. And I've checked in with Pastor over the years, and he said, you know, Daniel, she is so excited that we're here. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing with our Compassion Ministries, as Vic so well said, and many other things that you and Pastor have done over your time with the church. Thank you for being a great First Lady. And a Pastor Greg. So I didn't have the opportunity to do one of these road trips to Montana, by the way. I know Vic did, some of our other past, uh, some of our other servant leaders like Mark Pryor, Gus Pestis, Brian Elzars did, and just heard glowing reports uh, about just what a dynamic teacher and preacher. One of the things that really resounded with me was that you did a, an outfit change between services, and I haven't seen that done here yet, so I think you should do one of those. But, but I bring that up to say, you know, in some of our conversations as a leadership team, Pastors really um, understands that we need to mirror our community that we're serving, and so he's very big on diversity in hires of our pastors and our leadership team, as well as pipelining. Take a look at these two gentlemen back here, Jay and Jay. Um, they came from Montana with him, and they'll say a few more words, but I just say that to say the culture, the leadership team, as well as the teaching and preaching are phenomenal, and we're just so thankful and honored to have you as our lead pastor. We have this as uh, a gift from our servant leadership team, really a beautiful crystal, um, just kind of obelisk that just kind of says on there, thank you for uh, 10 faithful years of service leadership and pastoring our church family uh, and what a difference you've made in our lives. Uh, I want to say just a few words. I know you guys may or may not know, but I've been with John close to 17 years. I met him in my uh, mid-20s and uh, started doing ministry with him in Montana after moving from Washington State. And... A couple things that have really stood out to me. One, I got a chance to pastor three of his four kids uh, in youth ministry, which was kind of fun, uh, including one of our uh, pastors on staff, Pastor Ryan Gregg, and uh, had the opportunity to just see you guys as a couple and the way you loved each other, uh, how you lead your family, seeing that you've raised four kids. That, yeah, go ahead, clap for that. That love the Lord, uh, that didn't turn away from God, even though they were raised in a ministry environment, said they, they flourish and are continuing to grow what God has for them as adults, uh, now raising their own godly children. Uh, I got to see you guys uh, in your leadership in the midst of very varied seasons of good times and dark times and difficult times and saw how you chose to walk in integrity even in those dark moments. Uh, I had the privilege of being able to see uh, just how you were with my family as I, Heather and I raised our three kids and you got a chance to dedicate them and, and encourage them in their journey and walking them and walking us through kind of life's ups and downs. And what has stood out to me in the midst of all of it is that you have always walked with integrity. You've always walked with faithfulness. And what's been so important is you have a never give up, never quit, never sit down, never lay aside the call of God, desire on your life. And there's, there's a passion uh, for the gospel and you always point it back to Jesus and his mission. I will be relentless for that. And so I just wanna say thank you for your investment in my life as a leader and Jay and other team members we have in our staff. Uh, it means the world to us. And the verse that I was thinking of as I thought about today is Paul says some profound words in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. He says, I was delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but my very self. So thank you guys for sharing yourself with us. They asked me to cut back some of my comments, so I'm going to do the best job I can. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I was raised in Montana, and the first time I met John, I was about 13 years old. And I was up in the balcony, and here came this young man of God with a fire and a fervor for God that I'd never seen before. And he was preaching to uh, receive a vote to become our pastor, and in that moment, I knew uh, just in my heart that that was our next lead pastor. Fast forward through high school and through college, coming back, getting an opportunity to be part of the leadership team at Kalispo Christian Center, and honestly, the uh, opportunity you gave me to become a pastor. Uh, then of children's ministry, 
Uh, but I have, just like Jason said, seen the two of you, two imperfect people, an imperfect man and wife, that have raised the bar so high that it's really uh, stretched all of us to raise the bar in our own lives. And I want to thank you for your uh, mentoring, both as a spiritual father, but also as a mentor in uh, ministry. Uh, and it means the world. You know, John taught me uh, that the, the longest steps were the 13 steps from the curtain to the pulpit to teach the Word of God to you amazing people. And that sometimes that you have to swing by the, uh, the front pew and say something to your wife and apologize for that argument you had on the way to the church. <laughs> we all know we've been there. Uh, and... Um, you know, honestly, if I said anything, if I cut down the rest of my comments, it's thank you for letting me be part of your family. I've always felt like one of the Gregs uh, in the many years that I've been here. And then here, church family, um, from the time, 10 years ago, Vic mentioned a lot of the dynamic changes you saw physically. Uh, I, I think I can speak to some of the spiritual changes, uh, to discipleship being a key, to compassion being a key, and not so much let us entertain you and tell you about God, but let me bend down and wash your feet and tell you about this awesome God I serve. And so uh, I know it's been God. God is the one who plants, waters, grows, and harvests. But it's uh, God who puts you in leadership of this church. And if we look back 10 years to where we are today, multi-site, uh, watching you go through cancer, uh, watching you lead with vision to reach not just this community, but the whole Bay Area. And the most exciting part is we're celebrating 10 years, but I'm more, most excited about tomorrow and the next day, because I believe that with your leadership that we can reach the whole Bay Area and that we'll see us from one church in many locations to one church across the entire Bay Area that we can reach people for Christ. So <clears throat> Will you all join me in saying a very warm thank you very much for following the call, of, the call of God in your life, and thank you for faithfully leading us, our family, in everything. And here we go. We're going we're gonna to pray. We're bringing out a bunch of our servant leaders. And why don't we all gather around, John and Carrie, and Vic, why don't you lead us? I'm going to ask everyone if you would stand, if you would extend your hands this way, and we are going to pray God's blessing over our leader and his wife. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for being such an awesome provider for this church, Lord. As we look back in 10 years, Lord, we were in a season that we didn't have a shepherd that was caring for this flock, Lord, and you brought us John and Carrie. And what an incredible 10 years it's been. It's just blown by us. It's so many good things have happened, Lord. And God, we just commit this couple to you, Lord. We just pray for the future of this church. We pray for them. We pray that you would continue to use John for your glory, Lord. And we ask that you would just continue to give him vision like you have in the past, God, so that we can continue to reach and, and minister to the 75% in the Bay Area that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Use John, use this church for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, team. So guess what? The party is not over. We have an exciting invitation for each and every one of you right after this service at 1.30 p.m. in the 220s. The room's right over here. We'll be celebrating Pastor John and Carrie. So if you'd like to come by and just love on them, we'll have food there for you, and we look forward to welcoming you there. We're going to transition to a time of giving now, and we have two exciting opportunities. Our first opportunity is through our tithe. Our tithe is simply our best and first 10%. That's how we resource all the great things that we're doing here locally at the Bay Church. And I've heard it said beautifully is that when you give, you're not giving to the Bay Church, you're giving through the Bay Church. And we, this is what we do as a church family to really help to advance the kingdom of God. The second opportunity, if you feel so led, 
you can actually give to the pastor's 10-year anniversary. As servant leaders, we'd like to bless them in a tangible way. And so there's three ways to give this morning. The first is text to give, the number on your screen here. The second is online. You can also do the same if you want to give to the Greg's. It's the Greg's 10. There's also giving boxes at the back of the church as you walk out that you can drop your money in there as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, and you just blessing us in a rich way with great servant leaders, Lord, with great opportunities to serve you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you use the tithe and the offerings, Lord, for your will and your way to help advance your kingdom. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Feel free to stand as we worship.
Let's pray, Father, that's the story of our lives. Once upon a time, there was a day, I think for most of us in the house, uh, where we not only didn't know your goodness, we didn't even know you. And we're gonna find out today again in your word that we were a people of deep purpose and destiny and meaning and purpose in this life created in your image. I'm hoping that everybody in the house today will have a new understanding of that, get their arms around that liberating insight to help us become who you've destined each one of us to be for your glory so that when we leave this earth, our heart is happy and content. We ask it in Jesus' name and everyone said, good morning, everybody. Go ahead and be seated. Anyways, I really wanted to come out and just say thank you. Honestly, this has just been such a sweet and special day for us. Ten years, many of you were journeyed this whole time with us and even in the transition and all, and we're so grateful. You know, Daniel mentioned um, a little bit of, you know, my my response, like just worried, like what is this going to be like? Um, I'm not sure. And any of you mama hearts out there moving your whole family, although, you know, it's just this big transition for us. Um, and we were at a point where our youngest daughter was just entering her senior year in high school. And so we had to make the choice to leave her in Montana to, to um, finish that. And you could just, ugh, it was an out of body experience for me. But God, even in that midst of that hardness, I never, never doubted that this was his will. And I, I think um, just recently I was listening to the radio and I was taken back to the song that God kind of shared with me at that time. And I was listening to the song. It sounded kind of depressing. But at the end of it, it's like, Thy will be done, even in the hard times, even in the times. And I have gone back to that over and over again, that God is with us, even in the transitions and seasons in, in our lives, that it um, has been for his good and his glory that we can sing the song like we just sang. All my life you have been faithful. You have been so, so good. So that's the song I rejoice in today. And I just wanted the opportunity to just give my thanks to you because you have allowed us to flourish and um, be the people God has created us to be. Um, and I'm not one of those pastor's wives that sings, sings or plays the piano. But other things, you know. <laughs> I do other things, but I'm just so grateful for um, the ability to um, do the God call in my own life and not do it alone. So many of you, when I look at your faces, you have been partner, and this church is a great partner in our community. <clears throat> and a woman come up to me just in the lobby just uh, before the service, and she said, I'm so grateful to be part of the Bay Church because that's what people in the community are talking about, your input in the community. And when they're here, they feel mm -hmm. God's glory and his presence. And so it is a partnership that we get to do together. So anyways, thank you so much for the honoring us today. It's a very, very special day for us, and we're so glad to be family with you. When Carrie and I say that these 10 years with you are the best 10 years that we have experienced in 40 years of ministry, that's not lip service. It, it, the Bible talks about not using flattery in an untruthful way or a genuine way, and it's not flattery. It's what is in our heart. And ministry has been a wonderful ride for us, but it hasn't been like these 10 years. I mean, we were both born and raised in California. We look at each other and we go, what were we thinking? We never should have left home. And so um, the reason these 10 years have been a treasure is because you beautiful people are a treasure in our lives and to this community and certainly to the Lord. Thank you. Um, let me make a few summary comments. And this is going to be helpful for those of you that have only been in the church a few years, a few months, maybe a few weeks, maybe this is your first weekend. Uh, the church back in 2010, 2011 didn't have a pastor for 26 months, so over two years. And it was a very hard, difficult, sort of broken moment for the church. But 
there were still a group of people here with a beautiful heart uh, toward God and toward people. And so we just began putting one foot in front of the other and going. Uh, one of the other things we were looking forward to um, is uh, Glenn Cole and his wife Marianne had been so important in our lives. M my hero, our pastoral mentors and everything, we thought, oh, that's also in God's will going to be so cool to have so much time with PC. Called him PC, Pastor Cole. Six months in, he died. And so I'm carrying his casket down the main aisle with five of his grandsons uh, and Caleb, who you saw a few moments ago, and... Uh, carrying the body of my hero, my Paul. And so we continued to build. God enabled us to lead a church-wide uh, cultural transformation. Uh, when we got here, the church was not exclusively but largely event-driven. And by that, it was characterized by the really outstanding events, Flag and Scrooge and certain women's events, which were really wonderful in the moment. God's led all of us together to be more about a process-driven church that's discipleship in nature and to pivot and all the resources we've been putting in the events, we've now invested in dollars and cents in compassion. And that will never change. That is what God is calling us to do and be, a people of compassion, serving the beautiful people of Contra Costa and beyond one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, and we're never going to stop doing that. Then uh, we went through the Great Recession together. Some of you had your houses underwater. Do you remember that? Have you given thanks for God that you're not underwater anymore, hopefully? Uh, then we began an upgrade of the church that we thought would take us maybe two, two and a half years. It took us four and a half. It takes forever to get permits to build and so forth in the state of California, as you may know. But we did about five to six million dollars of improvements on this campus in that time. We only spent two and a half million and we paid for it all by the time we were done. So we dedicated it as it were debt free. Then we began a generational transition and that wasn't planned, that just happened. That some of the great veterans of this church family that for 20, 30, 35, 40 years had given great lay leadership. You know, they weren't pastors or ministry directors but they were deacons or they were leading all kinds of ministries, they retired and they said, hey, listen, Buster, I'm 75 now. I want a break. So you guys take it. And so we saw that happen and, and God raised up a whole new generation of dynamic young women and men to lead the charge. You walked with us through the cancer experience, by the way, just so you know, this literal month, two weeks from now, I have my final appointment with my oncologist, and if the tests come out good, and we have every sense they will, I'll be declared cured, and that's pretty awesome too. <laughs> we were very intent on uh, knowing that the God of heaven and of earth is very much loving, red and yellow, black and white, that all human beings are precious in his sight, and so God has more and more and more made this beautiful church family look like the Bay Area, look like Contra Costa County. And we will never change that because it's the heart of the Father for this church and for his church in the whole area. We changed our name. We changed the Constitution and Bylaws, which may not sound like a big deal. That actually is kind of a big deal. We're now a multi-site church, so you know about the campuses and the congregations in Concord and Brentwood. And by the way, they're blowing the doors off 19 miles east of us in Brentwood. We have another merger that will be happening, we believe, after the first of the year. More on that uh, to come. But also know when Caleb Cole got up there, by the way, that's Glenn Cole's grandson, God used us for a period of a few years to heavily invest financially and in time and workers, et cetera, to get Project Church in Sacramento. I preached there about a month ago. They're running six, 700 people now, and they started from zero. This church birthed that, and then we did another one in the Hercules area, so straight down west on Highway 4. So God is using us. It's not about us. It's about loving God, loving people, and building the kingdom, and we are not building our kingdom. We're building his kingdom. Uh, last thing I'll say, here we are, hopefully coming near the end of a pandemic, but I don't care what happens. I know in whom I have believed. 
And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've entrusted to him against that day. Bring it on. If God is for us, who can be against us? The end. And that's what I have to say. (laughs) Thank you, honey. Unless you want to preach. She is my best, best buddy. And my girlfriend, I'll say to people, yeah, I have a date with my girlfriend. And they don't know her or me very well. And they say, what kind of a church is this where the pastor has girlfriends? The pastor, my wife, dude, is my girlfriend. By the way, next year we'll have been married 40 years. And it passes so quick. Man, does it pass quick. Okay. Enough of those shenanigans, as the pastor would say. Let's dive into Bible study. Take your Bible or your device. We are in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Believe it or not, we are going to study all 50 chapters of Genesis over 40 weekends. We are at weekend number 3 in this series in Genesis, which we're calling When God Fell in Love. And today, we're talking about the fact that you and I, yes, you and I are divine imagers meaning the image of God is in us, we're divine imagers with a mission and with a purpose in this life. And so that's what we're going to do. I want to read to you, if I may, the, uh, the passage that we're going to be looking at. So join me at first uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and we'll read to chapter 2, verse 3. By the way, all the notes, everything, and much more than I'll actually be teaching are on the Bay Church app. So get on your device, go to the Bay Church app, uh, tap on Concord, tap, tap on message notes, and there you go. Uh, my buddy Ray Chaka is teaching the same message right now in uh, Brentwood. And so uh, let's read God's word together. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves upon the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food and it was so. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their glorious and vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. That's what we're going to study together in these moments today. I want to take you, first of all, on a video journey. Remember, we've got to see the forest, and then we've got to see the tree. We've got to see the micro, and we've got to see the macro. And one of our big priorities for us as your Bible teachers on weekends is so that we can let you see how the Bible is a unified, complete whole, that the Old Testament and the New Testament are inextricably linked and how they are linked and what that means. Let's talk about the image of God. Watch this. So if you lived in ancient Bible times, odds are you lived under the authority of a king. And many of these kings claimed that they were gods, and they would even call themselves the image of God. Meaning they had authority to tell people what to do, order things to be made. Yeah, they got to define good and evil. And these kings would often make statues of themselves, which in Hebrew were called tselem, often translated as idol or image. But for Israel, 
they didn't view their kings as the god. In fact, they were never supposed to even make images of God. It's exactly right, and that was really unique for that time and culture. This is rooted, first of all, in Israel's belief that you can't reduce the creator God down to any one thing in creation. But there's another reason. People aren't to make images of God because God has already made images of himself. When did he do that? Well, let's go to page one of the Bible. And the first person we meet there is God. He's the one with authority over all creation. He speaks and creation obeys. And he defines what is good and not good. In other words, he alone is king. But then surprisingly, as the pinnacle of all of God's creative work, he makes humans. And he calls all of them the image of God. So he gives all humans the authority to rule. Exactly. That's what he goes on to say. He tells the humans to subdue the earth and to rule it. And so this task that once belonged only to elite kings is here in the Bible the task of every human being. This was a revolutionary statement in its day because all humans are being called to rule and to participate in the human project. So what does this mean? I mean, how are we all supposed to rule? So the picture we get in Genesis is gardening. Gardening? Yes. Gardening. So they rule the earth by cultivating it, by harnessing all of the earth's raw potential and then making something more and new out of it. So growing food for each other. Yes, but that also includes growing families then, which become neighborhoods. And then they create communities where people are going to work and take care of each other and build businesses and cities that will expand to new places and so on. So ruling is really the day-to-day acts of our work and creativity. Yes, we take the world somewhere. This is humanity's divine and sacred task. Yeah, and this all sounds really nice. And humans have designed some pretty great things. But just as often we create things that cause a lot of suffering and a lot of injustice, so maybe we shouldn't actually be ruling. Yeah, so the Bible addresses this. In Genesis, what happens is that God gives humans a choice about how they're going to rule. So are they going to use their authority for the benefit of others, which is God's definition of good, or are they going to turn away and define good and evil for themselves and use their authority for self-advantage? And in the story, they choose to define good and evil on their own terms. And so this is the Bible's depiction of the human condition. So sometimes we pull off amazingly good stuff, but just as often, despite our best intentions, we act selfishly and we create evil in the world. And so we're stuck as mediocre rulers making a mess of things. But that's not the end of the story. So the Bible goes on and it makes this claim that all of this was resolved when God bound himself to humanity through Jesus. And he showed us what it looks like to truly rule as a human. So what does it look like? Well, Jesus ruled by serving and by seeking the best for others, by putting himself underneath them and loving not just his friends, but also his enemies. And that's not a typical way to rule. And not only that, Jesus confronted the consequences of all of the evil and the death that we have created by our messed up ways of ruling. And he takes it. I mean, he lets it kill him. And so when the New Testament writers looked back to Jesus' resurrection, they see a whole new future opening up for all humanity. Jesus is a new way to be human. Yeah, that's why they called Jesus the image of God or the new human. And not only that, they also believe that Jesus' divine life and power is now available to heal and to transform us to become our life and power. And this sounds really nice, but what does it really look like? So... Practically, the Apostle Paul said it looks like people being filled by Jesus' own presence and spirit, filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and integrity and gentleness and self-control. He says this is the new humanity that God wants to create in us so that we become people in whom God's image is being restored, people who will move the human project forward. And that's actually how the story of the Bible ends. It's a renewed world where God is on his throne and his servants are all around him, but they're the ones ruling over this new world, taking it into new, uncharted territory with Jesus as their healer and their guide. It's good stuff, isn't it? So helpful. Okay, let's uh, talk about four insights about the fact that you and I are divine imagers 
And you and I are divine imagers with a mission, with a purpose for our lives. So again, access your notes, keep your Bible open to chapter 1 and chapter 2. Here's the first insight I want to share with you, and it's so obvious, but it's this. We are created in the image and likeness of God. Now, stop for just a moment. Did you hear the words that just came out of my mouth? That is, wow, you and I are created in the image and likeness of the God of the universe. I mean, think how many people are living their lives, good-hearted as they may be, in some kind of wandering aimlessness, and yet we can have a sense, we can have an understanding that we are created with a purpose and we can live our lives with a purpose. What a way to live. And so uh, let me ask you this question, just kind of bring it down home and personal. Uh, Do you know any friends, family members, even in your own family, where you would look at the kid or some of the kids and say, man, that kid is a spitting image of his old man, or that kid's a spitting image of the mother. Just can you believe it? Splice a gene off their arm and (laughs) abracadabra. I mean, they just reproduce themselves. Kind of like Reese Witherspoon. Check this out. So there's Reese and her daughter, okay? But not only her, how about Tom Hanks and his son? So there's Forrest Gump Sr. and Forrest Gump Jr. right there. This next one is so touching to me. Uh, This is Danny DeVito, big Danny and little Danny. And uh, cute little kid, isn't he? I, I don't know how the tech team did it. That's kind of a Photoshop fun thing, so whatever. And then I've got some millennials hassling me uh, backstage before I came out that evidently, next picture. Yeah, so you can see how he's dressed and how I'm dressed. And they're saying, you look just like Steve McQueen in Bullet. I said, what's a bullet? And by the way, he's dead, dude. So what are you saying to me? Anyhow, yeah, that's Steve McQueen. So they wanted me to show it to you guys. That kid looks like the spitting image of etc. That's kind of the idea that you and I are created in the image of God. In other words, it's not just a physicality, but our personality, our temperament, our tendencies. In other words, our creator wants us to fully become a true image of who he is, to be like him, to act like him, to be an authentic representation and reflection of who he is. Now, I want to call a time out because I want to make an important clarifier, and it's this. Not in the Bible or anywhere in all of Holy Scripture does, are we ever taught that we will one day become gods. So when we say to be like Christ or to be like God, his character, his attitudes, his values, that's not to say we will one day attain godhood or divine status or become a divinity. That is not the Bible. And that very agenda got Lucifer tossed out of heaven, Lucifer who became Satan, the evil one. You say, John, why would you mention that? Because many religions on the face of planet Earth today teach exactly that, that discover the God within You can channel that God. You can become that God. You can become the divine essence. And here's the deal. If you can become divinity yourself, then you make the rules to the game because you are the man. You are the woman. You are the one, the person. That's not what the Bible teaches. So there's a very simple equation that goes this way. Our God is the creator. You and I are the creation. The end, he is the creator, and we are the creation. Uh, that, this is also, by the way, happened through history. If you go back, say, 10,000 years through human history, you will always see that inclination that you can attain divine status and become a god yourself. So we are created in the image and likeness of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love. So our church fathers for a couple thousand years have called it the Imago Dei. You say, John, what's the Imago Dei? It's a Latin term which means the image of God in us. And he created it that way. 
Now, let me uh, address a couple wrinkles that appear in the text. You may notice that in verse 26, did you catch it? When God's creating humanity, mankind, humankind in his image, the Bible terms it this way, let us make man in our image. And you may have raised your brow and said, I wonder why they're using the plural pronoun there. It's evidently a clear hint or inference or echo of Trinity. In other words, the clear understanding of Bible Trinity, that God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God eternally revealed in three holy persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And that's what's happening in verse number 26. This is the very kind of thing that we will address in our deeper class on Tuesday nights. Because I could talk about that for another 15 or 20 minutes, but we haven't got the time, okay? So deeper on a Tuesday night, also by Zoom. So the other thing I want to address is if you take a long look back at humanity, you will see that humanity, humankind, has always had another inclination when it comes to their gods, little g. They almost always, even the great empires, have made gods in their own image. There's probably not been a greater conqueror vanquisher of civilizations, military leader than Alexander the Great, who, by the way, was dead by 33 in a drunken stupor, uh, living a very nefarious life. But that notwithstanding, he was so taken with his own essence, he established some 70 cities from the vanquished peoples he conquered. The most notable is Alexandria in the Nile Delta of Egypt. Man has been creating gods in his own image, whether it represents their passions, their lusts, their lust for prosperity, the created world, etc. But false gods created out of stone, out of wood, out of precious metals, and sculpted by the hands of humankind. And that's why Paul writes in Romans 1. This is in your notes, but you got to check it out. In Romans chapter 1, Paul is doing kind of a sociological, theological survey of a history of the various religious expressions of mankind. And this is what he says. Exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images, there we are at that word again, images made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, reptiles, etc., And then what they would do, they would craft these lavish temples, and in the very center, they would set up the image of their God in their own image that is no God at all because it's nothing more than the materials from the soil of the planet crafted by human hands. And they would demonstrate obeisance and say, you are my God, bless me, prosper me, make me successful. Okay? How significant is it then that Jesus Christ is the image, the image of the invisible God? We learn that in the New Testament book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that he is God in the flesh. You say, John, why the flesh? Because the Bible says that God is spirit, that God is light, God is love, God is holy, God is spirit. And the first time we've ever seen a manifestation of God is in the person of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Now you say, okay, John, I'm tracking with you on the idea of divine imagers, that the image of God's created in us, but what about that what a, with a mission part? Let me just tell you what the twofold role of humanity created in his image is, but we'll unpack it a little bit more detail in a few moments Two things, and I read it to you in the text. We are created in God's image, number one, to rule and have dominion. And by rule and have dominion, that doesn't mean vanquishing God's created order for our selfish ends. It's more about a servant-hearted stewardship, the idea of ruling or having dominion. Our second purpose that we are created in his image is to be fruitful and multiply. So remember those two things, ruling and dominion, number one. Number two, be fruitful and multiply. Now, why was it important to God that we didn't create images 
of him that would, of course, be all be false because no image can capture the glory, the majesty, the magnificence, the beauty, the holiness of the one true God. He said, don't do that because I've already done it. You say, when did God create his own image? I'm looking at it in you and me. Remember, he created us in his image. Male and female, he created us. Think about that, friends. So we are to be the image or the representation of God on the earth today, and he lives in us by his Holy Spirit once we've begun relationship with him. Number two, the second insight that we can flesh out when we talk about being divine imagers with a mission is that we can experience the blessing of a mission and also have a mission of blessing. Let me put it to you in simple John speak. You and I are blessed to be a blessing. We're not blessed to hoard more, more, it's all about me. God entrusts his stuff to us so that we can be a conduit of his blessing to the people of the planet and so bring great glory and honor to his holy name by loving other human beings created in his image while simultaneously we are with servants' hearts stewarding the wonder of his creation. Blessed to be a blessing. So the Bible's telling us in these verses that we're looking at today that the Lord's created us with deep significance and purpose. Something important to do is what our life is all about. Now you say, John, I've got so many friends and these friends, man, I deeply care about these beautiful people. Their hearts are good, but they're always depressed. They seem so aimless and random in their lives. They're often filled with despair. Why is that? Very possibly because they have never understood that they too were created in his image, that they too have a life with a mission and purpose, and maybe you are the gift from God to their life to help them understand that when the time is right. And God will let you know when the time is right. So our mission then, ruling and dominion, as we steward or look after our Father's creation, not ours, his, not I own, only on loan as we steward our Father's creation, our Father's world, to be a blessing and to make it flourish. So often what we see happening on our planet today is abusing and misusing the wonder around us. But we see Adam and Eve, and when they were demonstrating their gracious stewardship of God's creation. You know what they were doing? They were working the garden, and we'll see that in the next couple weeks. And that was demonstrating their tending and their looking after and their care of the Father's creation. You're going to love this verse, Ephesians 2.10. For we are, you and me, God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which he has created for us to do. Wow! Think about it, Ephesians 2.10. So, we experience the blessing of mission in the mission of blessing. Number three, let's talk for a few moments about this insight that we clearly see with real clarity in today's passage, and that is the image of God in us and gender. This is a hot topic in 21st century culture, not just in America, but in the world today. Look again with me at the biblical passage, verse 27. So God created man. Okay, stop and look at me here for just a minute. Some of you see a male. No, not a male, a human male. He created Adam. Now, we would pronounce that name Adam in English, but it's a Hebrew word that's pronounced Adam. Stay with me. So God created man or Adam or humankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. 
So man is the word Adam in verse number 27. And you can see that Adam then is a them, not a him, in terms of what we would characterize as the male gender. In other words, God create, God's creation of humankind in his image is male and female, female and male. Now think about this beautiful partnership and not even in my context now as marital or sexual, but just the companionship of males and females, or as it should be, certainly in the church, that if we are not together stewarding God's world and God's work and tending it, and even in the church, if we're not doing it in servant-hearted companionship, somehow the image of God is compromised because he has created Adam male and female in his image. Now, let's be real. Like you, I am well aware of the conversation uh, happening in our culture today when it comes to gender. Uh, the default position essentially, and I'm not calling anybody out, that's not my heart, is that each person is determining what is right in their own eyes. By the way, that's something that happened at repeated junctures throughout scripture that the people walked away from God and then became, be, began to be the self-appointed authority, as it were, on ethical absolutes, if I can frame it that way. So that's what's happening in our culture today, each person determining what is right in their own eyes. Now, let me tell you what I'm not. I'm not a politician, I'm not a geneticist, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd of souls, and my job, and I do my imperfect best to do so, is to teach the Word of God, the Bible. Further, seeking to be like my Creator, my heart is filled with love for all people, irrespective of their life circumstances at the current moment. Like God, who always looks beyond what we are and He sees what we can be, that's how God wants us to look. That's what I'm trying to do in my life. And as a church family, that's what we're trying to do. In fact, we have a core value. And this is not window dressing, people. We believe this. And I've got people mad at me and mad at us on both sides of the aisle. Oh, well. Here's our core value. We will be gracious in acceptance. Do you know that I have people angry about at me and about at the church for doing that? Because they want us to pile on those nasty sinners. Hey, ain't gonna happen because that's not how Jesus treated quote unquote sinners. He just loved people and by the way, sinners loved him. Did you ever notice that? So much so, this was the handle that he had developed that, that they called him and it was a slur, it was like a cuss word. He is a friend of sinners. He is defiling himself. I mean, can you imagine that mindset? So I got some people mad at me. Oh, well. Uh, then if we finish our core value, we will be gracious in acceptance, the next three words, without compromising truth. We will never use the Bible as a bludgeon. We will never use it in a self-righteous, angry way to batter other people. But we are in a spirit of love and humility, not going to compromise what is clearly biblical truth. We believe this, that the Bible actually is an authority beyond ourselves. We believe that it's even an authority upon the governments that rule the nations of men and women in the moment. If you look at the long sweep of history, you'll understand what I'm saying. That being said, the Bible says with absolute clarity that he created us in his image, male and female. Now, when we talk about male and female, absolutely equal intelligence, equal worth, equal intrinsic value, equal ability, both fearfully and wonderfully made, yet each gender with beautiful uniqueness. So that brings us to the idea that we see emerging in Genesis 1 and 2 repeatedly. Uh, it's in your notes. You'll want to remember this. Throughout all the creation week and all these early Genesis chapters, we see the idea of fruitful pairings. Have you noticed this? So male and female are fruitful pairings. Remember, 
uh, uh, multiply and fill the earth and subdue and so forth, but also, not just that, the heaven and earth fruitful pairing, the land and water fruitful pairing, the sun and moon fruitful pairing, and here again, as male and female, and we, not the rest of the created universe, but human beings alone, are created in his image, male and female. And the wonder of it all is that we can participate through the sexual complement of our gendered bodies in the ordered, balanced harmony of God's beautiful creation. Fruitful pairings. Being male or female, the scripture seems to indicate, is who we are as a person. It's not just an attribute of the person, it's who we are as a person because he created us in his image, male and female. Fruitful pairings, let's think about that a little bit more. In our culture uh, today, when you kind of have contemporary culture on one side and uh, the biblical record, biblical truth on the other side, Uh, One of the important features that is emerging here between the lines is God's very high value that he places on family, on parenthood, on motherhood. Some of you have had such painful personal histories, you can barely say the word family because all it evokes for you in the dark places of your memory is some really horrible moments I'm deeply sorry that's in your history. There can be a redeemed tomorrow when you come to Christ, but I'm just very, very sorry that you have had that kind of pain. I myself grew up in a home without faith and a a home of some pretty rancorous divorce, Uh, but God's grace is sufficient. When we talk about parenthood, when we talk about motherhood, it's not to imply that a woman is less a woman or less a human if she isn't a mother. Not at all. Simply to reinforce that when God created male and female, he created us to be fruitful, to multiply multiply and have dominion over the creation. So keep those things in mind. When our culture says otherwise, when our culture says home is of no value, family's not a thing, or you can make family what you want it to be, Genesis says no, actually not so, because from the beginning, God has created us in his image, male and female, and the scripture indicates that on day six, the crowning and final day of God's creative magnificence, he pronounced it very good. For those of you that are single adults, which, by the way, is 40% of all Americans over the age of 18, never been married, don't want to be married, uh, divorced, uh, widowed, et cetera, et cetera, maybe separated in the moment, I want you to know that you are not half a person because you, at the moment, aren't sharing your life with another. God says one is a whole number, and we'll be talking about this season of singleness and how it can be a moment of flourishing in your life in weekends ahead. Let's wrap up today and talk about the beautiful balance of ruling and resting, ruling and resting. So I'm looking now at the first three verses of Genesis chapter two. Uh, We read them through together already, so very quickly, let me put it this way. And so the heavens and the earth were finished, and God finished his creative masterpiece, and he rested. Another good word for rested is ceased. He ceased his creative work on the seventh day. In other words, on that seventh day, he stopped and he looked past the last six magnificent periods of time called days. And he said, it is very good. He did not rest because he was tired. He rested because he was done. He ceased creating. And so you say, John, why is this seventh day so important to God. By the way, our Jewish fathers and mothers uh, termed it Shabbat, or the Sabbath. Six days you shall do all your labor, says the Ten Commandments. But on the seventh day, it is a holy day, a Sabbath unto the Lord your God. The idea being that we take one day and seven to look back upon our last six days of life through God's lens and evaluate how are we doing? 
That way the months and the years and the decades aren't flying by in our life and we're going, I can't believe how fast time's going. I don't even feel like I've got my life started and it seems to be careening to a close. How can this be? It's because you're not Sabbathing. You're not pausing once a week to take inventory, once a week to assess context and perspective, to understand through God's lens that he is the source of all that we have and are. And our busy lives, our careers, and our schedules are consuming us. And friends, hear me. Even our most diligent labor, important labor, urgent labor, can never fully satisfy our deepest yearnings because we are spiritual beings. And so Sabbath, that one day in seven, it's not just a day of recreation. Recreation's good. That's fine. Fun. Love fun. It's also a day, however, of recreation. In other words, if we don't Sabbath, if we don't remember this one day in seven to cease our labors, we will become enchained to the things in space in this material world. Stuff and this life will consume us and choke out all joy because what we were ultimately destined to do is to know God, our creator, and to be known by him and to worship this holy, loving creator God who is found only in time. So yes, have fun as well on that day of rest. Remember though, that fun alone cannot restore your soul, only God can do that. And our souls cannot be fully restored anywhere else. And everyone said, stand to your feet, friends, would you please? If you're here today and you would be encouraged by having somebody to talk to about where you're at in your life, in a totally non-judgmental way. We're just here to listen and care, no strings attached. We have connect areas that are available and some really just gracious people available uh, to talk with. Also, if you're watching by live stream and we still have many hundreds and hundreds of people uh, joining us by live stream that are part of the Bay Church family, you'll see on your screen of your device an area that you can ask for prayer or to receive Christ. We have pastors waiting to care for you. I want to encourage you around the idea of deeper. So you know we talk about growth track, and growth track is an opportunity uh, to kind of take that first important step of beginning to actually grow in our relationship with God. But I do want to emphasize again deeper. I have just scratched the surface this morning. And for those of you that have an itch to go deeper in God's word and some of these Uh, very complex issues actually that's what our class is about it's Tuesday nights right over here in the classrooms on this side of the campus at 6 30 till 8 o'clock and it's live and we've had about a hundred people live in each of those last couple weeks but we have more joining us by zoom you don't have to physically be here register for the class on our website and then we'll have a link automatically sent to you And so you could be at work, you could be at home, you could be at bed in your jammies, doesn't matter, and you could join us for Deeper in Genesis. And then know that uh, our podcast, we've developed that as well, and that will be available on Thursday or Friday of each week. And so this way, you have multiple opportunities to go deeper in Genesis and really get a grip on this all-important first book of the Bible. I want to leave you with a blessing. God created his world. He pronounced it very good. And then he entrusted us to tend it. To, to, he blessed us to be a blessing. And one of the beautiful blessings is in number six. And I say to you now, in his holy name, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you. And in Jesus' name, give you peace. I love you so much. Be blessed in him. See you next weekend.